Hello everyone, it's Michael Shermer here for The Michael Shermer Show. My guest today is the great Franz Duvall, the primatologist with his 13th book out called Different, Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. Franz has been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. He is the C.H. Chandler Professor in Emory University Psychology Department and Director of the Living Link Center at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Just to give you a feel for Franz's uh, depth of his writing, here's a list of his books. Chimpanzee Politics in 1982, which put him on the map, uh, showing that chimps, in fact, have complex uh, matrices of political machinations. They're little Machiavellians. Peacemaking Among Primates, Good Natured, Bonobo, the Forgotten Ape. It was really Franz that put uh, bonobos on the cultural map. The Ape and the Sushi Master, My Family Album, Our Inner Ape, Primates and Philosophers, The Age of Empathy, The Bonobo and the Atheist, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? And then his previous book, for which he was on this podcast, Mama's Last Hug. So Franz and I discuss sex and gender in humans, primates, and mammals. The difference between who you identify as versus who you're attracted to. Again, not just in humans, but in uh, primates. Binary versus non-binary versus a continuum. That is, how fuzzy can human sex categories be for a sexually reproducing species like ours? Or for that matter, um, other species. Particularly primates, gender differences in physical and mental characteristics. Who would homosexual, how would homosexuality evolve? Chimpanzees and bonobos and their differences. Sexual signals. What is the purpose, for example, of orgasms in women or nipples in men? Myths of the demure uh, female. The purpose, if there is any, to rape. Why would that have evolved? Does it have to do with sex or power or both? Murder and human violence. Dominance and power. Rivalry, friendship, competition, and cooperation. Maternal and paternal care of the young. Same-sex sex. sex. Uh, as you'll see, this gets pretty interesting with bonobos, <laughs> particularly. And then finally, mind-body dualism and Franz's idea that this all goes back to Descartes and this split between mind and body and that we have this kind of dualism uh, worldview that makes it difficult to understand uh, a lot of human behavior in the context of all primary behavior, primate behavior. All right, if you enjoy this podcast, I appreciate your support. Go to skeptic.com slash donate, where you can also subscribe to the magazine. Here's the print magazine, newly redesigned. And this one's on trans matters. The one that comes out next uh, is on abortion matters, which we present both pro-life and pro-choice arguments. Relevant, since the day I'm recording this, is the day the uh, Associated Press announced that a leaked document from the Supreme Court um, deliberations in the uh, Dobbs case that they're hearing that'll apparently be released June or July indicates that they will overturn Roe v. Wade. So this is a huge topic. I also asked Franz about that. All right. This episode is brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium is a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by the Teaching Company, you know them, The Great Courses. I have two, one on Skepticism 101 uh, and the other on Conspiracy Theories. Check it out. Wondrium brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and more, covering every topic you've ever wondered about and many you never thought you'd wonder about. I've discovered a bunch there. Here's one I just took for a second time. This is the course on the triumph of Christianity by my friend and colleague, Bart Ehrman. I've read most of his books. I've taken most of his teaching company courses. I listened to this one again a second time because it's just so good the way he uh, kind of gives all the background and debates among scholars. I love this part. Uh, basically, the question is, is how did you get from a small sect of 12 people and a messiah to... 2 billion people today. How does that happen? And uh, and so there's this turns out to be a huge debate amongst uh, biblical scholars and historians of religion. And uh, so Bart goes through all the different theories 
and then he presents his own, which I uh, I tend to agree with. It's more of a demographic uh, sort of population increase, slow growth, slow conversion, um, a little bit of fecundity there, uh, and keeping the families larger and and spreading the gospel that way. At any rate, um, check it out. If you subscribe to Wondrium, which is a subscription service now, uh, through the show, you get 20% off the uh, annual plan and then also a free trial, which is always great because you can go ahead and, and take all the time you need here on listening to different lectures and courses. Try it out. If you don't like it, then you don't have to uh, continue with your subscription. But why would you do that? Because it's just fabulous. It, there's just endless content. Let me tell you, I, I love this company so much. If I hadn't started Skeptic Magazine and done what I'm doing now, I would have done this because this company is so good at at doing what I think is important, that is to say, dispersing uh, knowledge and wisdom and great content to as many people as possible. And now it's so cheap, it's it's hard to believe. So check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. That's Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, wondrium.com slash Shermer. You get that free trial. You get 20% off the annual plan. Check it out. Thanks for listening. Here's the show. All right. And we are live. Franz Duvall, nice to see you. How are you? It's been a while. Yeah, the last time I saw you was, I think, at an airport or something. That's what I remember. <laughs> well, yeah. you've been on the show before, but yes, that's right. I ran yeah. into you. I think it was like the Toronto airport, and you were in line ahead of me, a couple of rows in those zigzagging mm-hmm. lines. And there was, if I recall, I think I was reading like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. There was a review. It was either of of one of your books or by you, and there you were. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So the new book is different. Congratulations. This is, I counted them up. This is your 13th book. Lucky number 13. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we're recording this on the day that, uh, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court document apparently was leaked that they may uh, vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. So everybody is talking yeah. about that. So I just thought I'd get your opinion on that since it's kind of the elephant in the room at the moment, uh, at least today. Um are there any primate examples of something like that, infanticide or, or, or whatever? And, and since you're from Holland, how do uh, Northern European countries handle this abortion issue compared to the United States? Oh, oh, it takes me back to the 1970s. My wife is French, and we would receive French women by train coming from Paris to Amsterdam. And we would receive them in the Netherlands because uh, abortion was illegal in France still. And it was already legal in the in in the Netherlands, and these women were very scared because they would arrive and they would think there would be police or it would be illegal. It was completely legal what they were doing. They were going to a hospital, and uh, they were very nervous about it. Uh, and we thought it was so sad that they had to travel so far <laughs> to get a legal abortion. And I think the U.S. is heading that way at the moment that people have to travel and and be scared um, to do this kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know what the the laws are going to be in Georgia. Do you, do you do you happen to know what they're planning on doing if it gets overturned? Yeah, I don't know. This uh, it does it doesn't over it doesn't ban abortions uh, internationally. nationally. It it just turns it back to the states, and so different states have different laws. As as I read it, about half are going to continue allowing abortions, and about half will ban them either altogether or just after six weeks. Something like that, up to six weeks. Um, but yeah, it's. But uh, you're asking, you ask, you're asking the connection with the primates is, of course, male control over female reproduction. If if we put it much more general, no, you know, in the primates we don't have a surgical uh, abortion that, or a pill abortion, um, but um, male control over female reproduction that's definitely a goal of many males in in the animal mm-hmm. world, is to be in charge of this, you know, and and I think that's the bigger picture is that um, the men of this country have decided that they are in charge of the bodies of women. So, so there is a, a big gender issue here. Uh, and, and I think it's highly problematic. And it, to me, it sounds like the Middle Ages, but that's where we are at the moment. Yeah. Of course, they don't say that. If you ask a pro-lifer what their arguments are, they don't say, we want to control women's bodies. I mean, they'll say something like, well, it's a human life and you're killing a human life. It's murder. And therefore, the state has an interest in stopping murders. Sure. Yeah. 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 They <laughs> they have all sorts of good arguments, but <laughs> it's still the controlling women. Yeah. 
Yes. Well, that's one of my three major arguments against the pro-life position in favor of pro-choice is that historically men have always lorded it over women and uh, controlling their, their sexuality, who they have sex with. Um, and, you know, the, and that's always been the case in other areas too. Men are bigger, stronger, uh, and so on. And, and so part of the point of having a Leviathan state is to put controls over male violence. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's been good. That's been a good thing for civilization. I mean, it's, as, as Pinker notes, it's led to the reduction of violence and uh, across the board. And that, that would be one more example of that. And as you know, in evolutionary psychology, they talk about mate guarding and jealousy evolved so that men can control women. That's the whole point. So the sure. whole point of civilization is we got to push back against that. But, you know, um, people often say uh, that the natural order is that males dominate females. And, and some people even believe that the size difference, that men are bigger than women mm. and stronger. And, and, and in the other primates, it's even more extreme. Like in the gorilla, it's even the male is twice the size of the female. People often think that that male size has to do with controlling women, that that that's the goal of why the males are bigger. But it has nothing to do with it. The, the studies that have been done on correlating behaviors in the primates and other species find that male size and the sexual dimorphism has especially to do with male competition, male-male competition. So the more male-male competition, the bigger males grow because then they are more successful in that competition, that they control and dominate females is sort of secondary. It, that's not the main goal in life. The, the goal is to compete well with other males. And so the, when people say the natural order is that males dominate females and that's why males are bigger and so on, I think they have it wrong. And, and in addition, in my book, of course, I explained that we have two close relatives who have a very different arrangement between the sexes. And so even for our two closest relatives, it's not such a simple picture that males control females. Yes, that's a great point, uh, and that gets us into your book. But just more generally, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, I've known you a long time. I've, I've seen you give many public talks all the way back to the 90s. There's this sense I, I, I get from the public that they're looking to you for some deep insight into human nature through primate behavior, particularly the great apes and the chimps and, and bonobos. Is there a sense that you have that... Um, if we can understand them, we'll understand ourselves better? I think we will know where we come from, so to speak. We don't directly descend from chimps or bonobos. We have a common ancestor with them who was probably a bit different, you know. Um, but I think uh, people do want to know where we come from, what our background is. And, and with the gender issue, in addition, they hear so often that gender is cultural and social, and that's all it is. Uh, and I think many people are a bit skeptical about that. And so they want to hear from the primatologist what he thinks about the biology of gender, the, the biological side of things. And, and I'm there to explain that and, and, and actually make matters, more, make matters more complicated because <laughs> it's not so simple. Yeah. Indeed. Well, you're the man that put bonobos on the map, but there's, all, there's this sense of which one are we more like, bonobos or chimps? And it's a weird question because, as you said, we're not from them. You know, we, we are cousins. We have a common ancestor, what, six to eight million years ago. That's a long time. Why would anybody think we would be like one or the other? And why, why would anybody think we can learn from that? Yeah, we, uh, th there's a lot of wishful thinking in that also, is that generally women like the bonobo better. Uh, bonobos are female-dominated and more peaceful and have more sex and... Uh, sort, sort of hippies, and, and many women uh, go for the bonobo, so to speak. Many men are uncomfortable with the bonobo, especially anthropologists, because they have built a whole evolutionary scenario around male violence and warfare and hunting, and uh, a primate hippie doesn't really fit in their uh, view. So the anthropologists are not so happy with the bonobo. They prefer the chimpanzee, and they always talk about the chimpanzee, which is male-dominated and more violent. And so you have these groups of people who prefer this one or that one. I feel since they are genetically exactly equally close to us, because they split after they split off from us, uh, we, we need to just take 
take them both into account and, and we don't need to choose between the two. And, and they both have something to offer that I find interesting. So for example, even though the anthropologists rarely talk about the eroticism of the human species, they are very shy about it, uh, like most scientists, um, uh, the human is a very sexy species, a very sexy primate and, and very sex obsessed. And, and so, in that regard, the Bodobo is a very interesting character to uh, to contemplate. Uh, and then the chimpanzee is is male bonded. Lots of males have a lot of rivalry and competition, but they also hang out together and they groom each other and things like that. Very male bonded species, and, and that's something they share with us. And so they they both have something to offer in the discussion about gender and sexuality. Uh, and I think we should take them both into account. Yeah. One of the things I like about your book is there's some autobiographical tidbits in there. Uh, I remember back in the day when crowding leads to violence was a it was a popular theme in science, and you pointed out that in fact, if you live in a country like where you grew up, where there was a lot of crowding, in fact, the people find ways to resolve their conflicts without it turning violent, and that so much of this depends on where you happen, what what the, where the scientist happens to have been born and raised and how that influences what they think they're seeing in the data, right? So there's a little bit of sociology yeah, yeah. of science there. Scientists in your are new affected book, by their culture. Yeah. Yes, yes. And they in your new book, on? you talk about yeah. being raised raised with, uh, what, six brothers? And so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and you went to an all-boys school and how that affected your own uh, research and thinking and then what an eye-opener it was <laughs> to encounter the female part of the species yeah, yeah. other than your mom. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think my curiosity about gender partly comes from that um, mostly male family that I had. Uh, and I also went to boys' schools uh, in the beginning. So it's only when I went to college that I, I saw more girls. And I had an intense curiosity about that, uh, about the differences between men and women. Uh, at some point, I joined, as a student, I joined a feminist organization to hear more about this. And, and this was an organization that uh, wanted to bring equality and, and involve both men and women. Uh, at some point that organization became hostile to men. And so then I left because uh, I, don't, I don't feel I need to reach equality by bashing men, but um, I wasn't part of that. But I was curious about it. And, and so I've always been curious about sex differences and gender differences, uh, maybe as, as a part of my background. And also because when, as a primatologist, I talk about sex differences, people are always very curious about it. I notice that people want to want to hear more about it. And so uh, I, I notice that there's a certain curiosity in society about the biological side of gender. Hmm. Yes, interesting. So let's start there. What's the difference between sex and gender, not just in humans, but in primates? Well, sex is a term that we use for the biological sex, like genitals, hormones, chromosomes. Sex is mostly binary, not entirely, but 98, 99% binary, male, female. Um, and in biology, of course, it's def defined by the size of the gametes more than the genitals, you know. So, the, so sex is pretty well defined in biology, even though the, that intermediate category is very complex. It can, it can get really complex in some species, I, I can tell you. And then gender is a term that John Money invented, a, a sexologist, who noticed that some people are born with one sex, but they don't feel like they belong to that sex. And they, they have a different gender identity. And he got interested in that. And... Um, uh, John Money, the sexologist, he invented the term gender because he had noticed that some people are born one sex and then uh, at a certain age, a young age, they, they start to feel like they belong to another sex, the other sex. And, uh, and so he, um, he saw that there were lots of negative labels for these people, like they were weird or queer or abnormal. Um, a lot of negative labels, and he wanted to get around that. He, he wanted to have a friendlier, more scientific label for them, and that's how he invented the word gender for it. And he said gender is how you express yourself, how you identify, uh, what kind of habits, masculine or feminine, you adopt. And so gender is more divided, not in male and female, but in masculine and feminine. 
and everything in between. So, so gender is a much more flexible concept and, and has many more possibilities than, uh, than sex. And, and, and so John Money uh, did that. And, and at the same time, he got into trouble uh, because he had he was involved in, in, a, in a boy who was raised as a girl because of a, the boy had lost part of his penis and they started to raise the boy as a girl. And, and he claimed that that was all possible, that gender was so flexible that, that it would be a possibility. But, you know, um, that child actually was very unhappy and, and later committed suicide. And so he had presented the flexibility of gender as a bit, he had exaggerated the flexibility of gender. And, and so he got into trouble over that. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting story. It shows that uh, biology does matter, <laughs> as you point out in the book. Yeah. So if we think of sex as being, you know, 98, 99%, you know, male, female, with a few uh, chromosomal exceptions, XXY, XYY, and so forth. Um, but gender is more fluid. But clearly, with the example you just gave, it's not 100% fluid. You can't just be anything you want. It's not totally cultural. So at the current understanding of science, how flexible is gender, do you think? in humans and then primates? Yeah, I think gender remains always tied to sex. Uh, and, and so the people who say that gender is independent of that, is that as a cultural construct independent of biology, I, I don't believe that because we have a gender duality because we have two sexes mainly. And uh, I think if we were a cloning species, let's say we, we had no sexual reproduction, we were all the same. Cloning means that we're all sort of identical. Um, I don't think anyone would have invented genders there. Um, so the genders come about because we have sexes, and they always remain somehow tied to the sexes, even though gender is a much more flexible concept. And I agree that we need to make that distinction between gender and sex, because otherwise you forget about all the cultural influences that are there, which are immense, you know, the... the, the the two the two genders interact quite differently in this culture compared to let's say Saudi Arabia or India or Japan and so uh, each culture has its own way of expressing yourself or, or clothing you or hairstyle and so on so so the gender concept is very useful and I think it's also useful for other primates so so for example uh, a chimpanzee is adult when he's sixteen meaning that there's a very long time. For example, the nursing period is five years. There's a very long time of dependency and development and absorbing the behavior around you because the, the apes are very good at aping. That's why we have that verb. They, they ape others. And uh, young, young males and young females, they learn from adult males and adult females how to behave. And so I think the gender concept is not limited uh, to the human species. Mm. Right. Then let's also make a distinction between who you identify as, male or female, in the gender, and who you're attracted to, same sex or opposite sex. How do you think about those issues? Yeah, that's a very different issue. People sometimes conflate that as the, the transgender, being transgender or sexual orientation. These are not the same thing at all. Uh, the, the thing that they have in common... It, is that they arise very early. So, so we have learned that from all these attempts of conversion therapies with uh, homosexuals, where people have tried to convert them and, and clearly it's, that's not working and it's actually a scam, that whole thing. And so uh, we know that the, the, both the sexual orientation and the sexual identity, they arise very early in life, before puberty, and they are basically irreversible. So that's why I'm saying in my book, they are constitutional. They, they're part of what you are. You, and, and we don't know exactly if it's genes or hormones or brain. We, we don't have a clear idea, but about gender identity, we have some indications that's in the brain uh, by studies in Amsterdam by Dick Swap. But um, in general, I, I say it's constitutional. It's part of who you are. And so you shouldn't be trying to change it. It's a bit like trying to change someone who's left-handed into right-handed. Uh, those are sort of disastrous projects, you know? And, and so it's important to... There is some biology involved, no doubt, but we don't know exactly what. Um, and, and it is interesting that 
the LGBTQ community has embraced biology for that part. So they will say, I, I, I'm born that way, you know, that's, that's how they say it. Um, but at other gender issues, biology is not embraced at all. It, you know, if, if, if you look at the gender studies at the university, they have not embraced biology the way I think they should be. So um, there's a sort of ambivalence there, which has to do with ideology. It's like biology is welcome in that area because you can use it as an argument that you cannot be changed. And in other areas, it's not welcome. But, and I feel biology should be part of that whole discussion uh, regardless, you know. Absolutely, 100%. And you talk about Simon LeVay in your book. I remember I had him come speak for me at Caltech. You came, came spoke for us at Caltech, too. And, and he was, this was at the time when there was this push by the gay community to make sure it's clear it's, a, it's, it's not a lifestyle choice. They were born that way, and therefore there should be some biological yeah. markers. And he had, you know, the gay brain. Like, and I, was it the hippocampus yeah. <laughs> where there were some yeah. uh, straight men versus yeah. gay men? And he put this slide up, you know, like a neurological slide of neurons from a gay brain and a straight brain. I think it was in the hippocampus. You see, you can clearly see here this massive difference, and everybody's looking at like, where? <laughs> it's hard to see the difference, you know. And yeah. uh, it was like, okay. <laughs> Because these areas are very small, like like the one for gender identity that uh, Dick Swap discovered. I think it's as big as a grain of rice or something. I mean, this is these are not big areas of the brain, and so uh, there is still quite a bit of doubt. I would say I'm not a neuroscientist, but uh, I don't think we're all in agreement of how these things work, uh, and a lot needs to be discovered. But it is clear that it is constitutional in the sense that once. It arises, let's say you, the gender identity is different from the sex you're born with. Once that arises, it, it very often is not um, reversible. Hmm. Right. Well, but, but so politically, sense, this uh, is, yeah. as you just noted, you know, in, in gender studies departments, for example, there's not much emphasis on biology. You can be whatever you want. And I know that a lot of my gay friends are concerned about this. It's like we, we spent decades arguing against conservatives who said we just made a lifestyle choice and it was the wrong one and they can help us convert and so on, that that was all bullshit, that this is how, who I am. It's my constitution. Uh, I didn't choose uh -huh. to be gay at all, right? And then now yeah. the emphasis seems yeah, to be, yeah. well, you can be whatever you want. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Politically, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. the wrong argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So by, by having this ambivalent attitude towards biology, I think they are creating a theoretical mess, basically. And, mm -hmm. and it's better to bring biology into all discussions. Uh, and, and that's part of the goal of my book is to, to show how you could do that by looking at our closest relatives. Uh, but I'm not a neuroscientist. And, and so in that regard, I cannot be of much help, you know? Yes, but just, just to make that point, like Andrew Sullivan, the gay conservative writer, says that, um, like, for example, if you're a young man, maybe 13 years old, and you find yourself attracted to other boys or other young men, uh, and somebody comes to you and says, well, maybe you're secretly inside a woman, and that's why you're attracted to men. And his response is, mm. no, maybe you're just a gay guy, and that's okay now. <laughs> and, uh -huh. uh, you know, there's so <laughs> so much of this is is that we don't have a lot of science on, you know, people that, there, there's the, the, the early gender use dysphoria at an early stage, like age two, three, four, five, you know, they start acting, they, they act differently. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But there's this new phenomenon of teenagers uh, all of a sudden identifying as the other gender or somewhere in between or non-binary non or, or whatever. And the concern is that if they act on it, what if it's not actually in part of their constitution? What if it's a social contagion kind of thing? This is the yeah. argument uh, uh. Uh, that, that some critics make. And uh, I think we just don't know a lot of science about what happens to the teenage brain. Yeah. I, I think that's, a, from what I understand, a very small percentage of the transgender community that starts that way. Uh, but I, I do describe in the primates uh, gender diversity. So it's, that's an interesting addition in the sense that um, we scientists, we usually look for typical behavior. We look for the typical male, the typical female, and we describe that. But if you look beyond that, you see individuals who are different. So, for example, in the chimpanzees, I describe in my book a female named Donna, who from very young age onwards acted more like a little male. She liked to wrestle. For example, males wrestle, uh, mock fight 
a lot more than the females. She liked to do that and she would seek out contact with adult males for that. And the adult males, curiously enough, they, they would play with her. No, normally they play with young males, but they played with her. And so that was the first sign that she was different. And then she grew later. She grew into a robust female with big hands and a big head and a lot of hair. And she looked more like a male than like a female. From a distance, you would swear she was a male. She associated with males. She acted like a male. And of course, I cannot ask her her identity, but who knows how, how she felt, you know? But uh, clearly, we have that kind of gender diversity. I also describe males who don't play the macho game, who are not into politics and, and trying to become the dominant male, who stay out of all of that. So we have gender diversity. We have individuals. We also have individuals who show more homosexual than heterosexual behavior. So, so we have all that diversity that you see in human society. But we primatologists, we have not focused on that. We, we have sort of ignored it because it is only one in 10 or one in 20 individuals who are like that. And we have sort of igno ignored that. But the gender diversity that you see in human society, I don't think is uh, completely unique. It's not, it's not a product of society. Uh, it, it's not a product of us being humans and being so cultural. Uh, I think it's part of primate biology, basically, the variability that we see in the primates. Yeah, Richard Dawkins calls this the tyranny of discontinuous thinking or binary thinking. You know, it's not everything mm -hmm. is black and white and binary. There are spectrums. And that, that doesn't mean the spectrum is yeah. you can be anything you want. You can have, I think the way you described it was, uh, what, two overlapping fuzzy sets where on the on mm -hmm. the borders and the margins, there can be overlapping, and you, that should be yeah, acceptable. Yeah, yeah and, and we know in biology, of course, you talk to any biologist, uh, individual variability is, is, you know, is the game, and in, 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 uh, also in natural selection. Uh, and, and so you look at a forest, I'm looking at the moment at my forest outside, you look at a forest and you see two trees of the same species, and they are very different. And we, we're used in biology to individual variability. So we shouldn't gloss it over and we should not. Uh, human society has a tendency to make boxes in which you need to fit, you know. Uh, but individual variability is, is all over biology. Yeah. So talk about the difference between chimpanzees and bonobos as, as what, different survival or reproduction strategies. Why would those two different strategies have evolved that way and what can we learn from that? Yeah, we don't know that. We, um, the, the bonobo is peaceful and female dominated. The female dominance is collective dominance. An individual female cannot dominate a male. So if, if, if at a zoo, for example, when I worked at the San Diego Zoo long ago, they had a group with one male and one female bonobo. In that case, the male was dominant. As soon as they added a second female, the females were dominant. So, so the, the dominance of females is a collective dominance, which means that the females need to um, work on their bonds and, and maintain their bonds and groom each other and they have sex together. A lot of the sex in bonobos is female, female sex. They have a big clitoris, which probably helps make it a pleasurable affair for them. And, and so that's the bonobo. And we think that it's possible for bonobos to live this way in the wild. Um, because their ecology is somewhat different from the chimpanzee. So, so, so these are ideas of Richard Wrangham, for example, that um, bonobos don't have competition from gorillas. Uh, they don't, there's no gorillas in their area. And so they can have the whole forest for themselves, including the ground vegetation, which normally the gorillas would eat. Uh, and as a result, they can stay more together and they travel together instead of spreading out like the chimpanzees need to do in order to get enough food. So bonobos can stay more together, which allows the females to have this bonding, this sisterhood uh, thing going, which for the chimpanzee females is going to be difficult because they need to spread out. And so that's one of, one of the sources of thinking is the ecology is different. Hmm, interesting. Right. And, but again, we always look to these like, well, which is the better one to be? as if there was a, a political ideology that you can map onto these biological differences. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we want to think like that. Uh, but I think, um, as I said, I think women go for bonobos and men go for, often go for chimpanzees, but 
I feel we don't need to make a choice between the two. I find them both yeah. very instructive about human behavior. Well, but you hear things like uh, the world would be better if women were running countries rather than men. And, or, or then you'll see a picture of uh, Putin, you know, shirtless on horseback. And, you know, that's that alpha male, mm -hmm. macho male, alpha male, which you help uh, <laughs> popularize as a term. That, you know, Putin seems to be the paradigmatic yeah. example of that now. <laughs> and that seems to be yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. a good way to be. But, you know, in the COVID crisis, uh, people have made these comparisons between male leaders and female leaders. I don't think the male leaders, like, let's say, Bolsonaro and Trump, they come off as extremely effective <laughs> during the COVID crisis. And so um, uh, female leadership is entirely possible, also in human society, I would say. And if you look at the other primates, there's plenty of female leadership. All the primates have a female hierarchy. Uh, females are, are just as hierarchical as males, even though in the psychology textbooks, often the men are described as more hierarchical than women. Uh, I don't believe that because in all the primates, the females have a hierarchy. They have an alpha female. A female leadership is really not hard to find in the other primates. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Well, again, we're always looking for lessons. Maybe we don't need to do that. You know, we're, we're our own species and with great variability. And so sometimes women leaders are fine. Sometimes men leaders are fine. It just depends. It's so complex. I mean, Angela yeah. Merkel did just fine. Germany's longest, well, second longest uh, leading um, uh, chancellor in, in its history. So let's talk about uh, adaptationism in, in, in evolutionary theory. Um, you know, we often think of, well, what good is X? What's the purpose of X? You know, so, but when you run into things like, well, why do males have nipples or why do females have clitorises? What's the purpose? And you talk about that a little bit in your book. So expand on that a bit. Uh huh. Yeah, the, the clitoris, there was a debate 15 years, 20 years ago. I think it was initiated by Elizabeth Lloyd, the philosopher, uh, that the clitoris was, was, superfluous. We, we didn't need the clitoris. We have a clitoris, she said, uh, because the males have a penis. It's basically a bit like the, the male nipple. All the, all the primate males, including gorillas, everybody, all the primate males have nipples, but they don't need them. They have them because females need nipples. So, so that was the thinking about the clitoris at the time. And, and Stephen Jay Gould supported that thinking, and he called the clitoris a glorious accident. Now, we have now different information, you know. First of all, we know that all animals have a clitoris, all, all mammals, from the mouse to the elephant, they have a clitoris. We also know from anatomical studies that the clitoris has as many nerve endings uh, as the penis and has uh, very big nerves that service the clitoris. So, so the information that comes from it is apparently very important. That's why we have big nerves serving it. So the clitoris is actually much more evolved and important than people assumed at the time. It's not really comparable with the male nipple. And the biggest clitoris is found in animals like humans. They have a big clitoris, but also bonobos is even bigger. And, and the biggest one is in the dolphin. The clitoris is big in animals that have a lot of um, extra eroticism, not, not necessarily focused on reproduction, uh, but focused also on social life, uh, like in the bonobo and the dolphin. So, so the, the vision of the clitoris has changed. And the clitoris is a pleasure organ for the female, just as important as the penis is for the male, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, sexual pleasure is an important part of social life. And so, is, so we, are, we are changing the view of that part, but we're also changing the view of female sexuality in general. Uh, this started with work on the birds, not just the primates, but on, on birth studies where we found that females have, have sex with multiple partners, not just with the male they are building a nest with. Uh, and so now the view of female sexuality has changed. We see female sexuality as much more enterprising and adventurous and proactive than we did 20 years ago. Right. Yeah, I think that there's this myth that women were just receptacles for male sperm. Therefore, they just have to lie there and, and, and the guy just does his thing. Well, this is, you know, pretty crude and inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a sort of Victorian view. 
Darwin was one of the first, uh, even though Darwin is now being blamed for being racist and sexist and so on, but Darwin put women, or let's say females, on the map by saying that there was sexual selection and that females were very active in there in, in making the selection. And uh, so Darwin, I instead of giving a females a completely passive role in his story, he gave them an active role. So that already was, was a difference. But he thought, like most Victorians at the time, I think, he still thought in terms of male superiority and so on. Yeah. Yeah, you cite David Buss's book uh, and his co-author, I forget her name now, uh, Why Women Have Sex, I think was the name of the book. And that was a real eye-opener for a lot of people. Like, you mean women have sex for a whole variety of reasons? Like men? Yeah. <laughs> Boredom, <laughs> curiosity, yeah, yeah. Uh, revenge, <laughs> and so forth. Not just, you know, I want to have yeah. a baby, so you're the man. <laughs> Yeah, but very interesting in this regard are the theories of Sarah Hardy, who, um, mm, yes. yeah, who yeah. has theories about, yeah, she has theories about why females have sex with more than one male. Because in principle, of course, a female chimpanzee, she would need to have sex only with one male and a few times, and she would be pregnant. So why does she seek out lots of males and has lots of sex with them? And uh, Sarah Hardy has ideas about that, which, which relate to infanticide. To avoid infanticide, the female needs to have a lot of males who consider her a recent sex partner, and, and that prevents some of that behavior. Oh, yeah, I found that reference. Cindy hmm. Meston, sorry, that I forgot her name. Cindy Meston and David Buss. Okay. Yeah, some of the reasons yeah. range from, I hmm. wanted to please my boyfriend, to we had nothing else to do. I was curious how he'd be in bed. <laughs> and uh, it's astonishing that, you know, here we are in the 21st century, and it, you know, it's like science is finally getting around to recognize, oh, women are actually have their own motives and they have their own uh, uh, variations of their behaviors, just like men. Well, why did it take so long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think, I think um, the dam broke when we did paternity testing on the birds. So, so you have monogamous birds, songbirds, and they were always held up as an ideal. Like, don't we want to live like the songbirds, male, female, children, you know, perfect life. Uh, and then people started to paternity test the eggs in the nest and found that some of these, these eggs were from a different male. And uh, the first reaction is interesting. The scientists, the first reaction was, the females must have been raped by extra males, outside males. So that was their reaction, because they couldn't imagine it otherwise, until, of course, now we know that many of these females, they seek out contacts with other males. They're actively involved in it. And uh, so I think that was the first finding. So it was not in the primates, it was in the birds. And now in the primates, of course, I describe how our field changed when we got more women involved, and uh, this started with Jane Goodall and people like that in, in the 1960s. But now we have, of course, in primatology, probably more women than men. And the perspective changed. Instead of focusing on the male hierarchy and male dominance and the violence and so on, uh, the women were interested in maternal behavior, in bonding and kinship networks, uh, and in female choice sexual choice, F females choosing their own partners. So, so they might ignore, for example, the male hierarchy. The most dominant male was not necessarily the most attractive male in the eyes of the females, you know? So, so, so I think female primatologists have changed the field tremendously. Uh, and uh, now we have a much more, um, I think, a much more balanced view of primate societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good argument for diversity in science. Just having somebody of a different gender in your field brings a different perspective. They ask different questions. I mean, that, mm -hmm. even medicine was pretty slow to come around on that. You know, with mostly male doctors prescribing to women male doses of meds, it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way, right? Different physiology, yeah, different yeah, body so size, and so on. That's why NIH now has rules about that. NIH says if you want to do a study on a certain phenomenon in medicine, using rats or mice or whatever, uh, you, you need to have a gender balance between them. You, they, they need to be of different sexes. Because yeah. in the old days, people would maybe not use um, female rats because they go through cycles and they felt, that was, they felt that was inconvenient, you know, or they would get pregnant and they felt it was inconvenient. 
Yeah. You mentioned rape. That's a hot topic in evolutionary psych circles. At least it was when that book, The Natural, what was it, The Natural Origins of Rape, came out. Um, Randy Thornhill and his colleague. Anyway, um, so that was back to that adaptationism type argument. Did rape evolve as an adaptation? Therefore, it's in our genes as if to excuse it. Or is it a byproduct of something else? Does it have to do with just sex? Is it power? Is it sex and power and control? How do you think about that? Yeah, the, that book, um, I didn't like that book at all, The, the Natural History of Rape, um, trying to explain rape as an adaptive strategy. Uh, because you would need, um, first of all, you there would need to be genes involved in in raping behavior. Um, so, so rapists would have have to be genetically different from non-rapists, so to speak. And, and that has never been demonstrated. And you would have to demonstrate that raping is um, enhances reproduction of a male, uh, which also has not been demonstrated. And, and a lot of the rape, of course, the rapes that occur in human society um, are with women or too old or girls who are too young or, or sometimes male to male rape. And so, so, so there's quite a bit of rape that is not reproductive at all. So um, I asked when I reviewed the book, I reviewed that book for the New York Times. I asked, how would a small scale society react to a rapist? You know, if, if there's a young man who rapes somebody, how would a small scale rea uh, society react? And I, I didn't think it was going to be a positive reaction. And then uh, Kim Hill, uh, the anthropologist, he wrote a, a long article with a mathematical um, approach based on his knowledge of hunter-gatherer societies, saying that these men uh, who rape, they, they are not going to do very well because they will be either kicked out of the society or the relatives of the woman would uh, kill them or they would lose all their friends and <laughs> or the, the woman abandons the child if there is a, a product, um, a reproductive product. She would abandon it, probably. And so he had all sorts of arguments why a rapist would not do very well. And if I look at the other primates, which is, of course, the goal of my book is to compare with other primates, rape is extremely rare. If it was such a great strategy, why wouldn't it be common? So, so orangutans, we know rape, but that's basically the only species for which we have a lot of data on that. They always trot out the orangutan as an example, but that's of the 200 primate species, there are not many where rape is common. And so in chimpanzees, it's extremely rare. There is quite a bit of violence by males against females, but rape is not really part of that. A forced copulation, we call it usually. And in bonobos, it's com completely excluded. It's not possible because the females dominate the scene and the females will not accept that kind of behavior for sure. So in our two closest relatives, Rape is not common. It's a very rare behavior. So if it was such a great reproductive strategy, why wouldn't it be common, you know? So why does it happen at all? Is it a byproduct of something else, control or power? Or is it just something humans do because of culture? Is it, is it a patriarchal cultural thing? Yeah, humans, uh, one of the problems with humans is that we, ha we have nuclear families who tend to live in separate areas. That's, of course, not true for all people in the world, but nowadays we have a house for this family and a house for that family. And that enhances male control over females. So uh, during the COVID crisis, for example, when we were all locked up in these houses, domestic violence increased. And I bet rape increased as well. So one of the things that happens is rape is very often done by familiar partners, not, not by outsiders, but by the husband or brothers or whatever, um, uh, our family arrangements and living arrangements uh, stimulate male control, I think, uh, and make it impossible for women to get help. So, for example, a bonobo female who's harassed by a male, she only needs to, to give a loud scream and there will be females there who will help her and, and chase the male away. And in chimpanzees, in captivity, for sure, I've seen that many times, in captivity, if a male is too insistent in, in a sexual context, the female will get support from other females. And the females all together will change. Uh, Ten of them will go after the male. And he will uh, learn that this is not a good strategy for him. So mm -hmm. um, I think our family arrangements don't help the situation. You know, they, they make domestic abuse 
more e easier. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Sort of a byproduct of modern culture, maybe huge populations, more isolation, more opportunities for that mm -hmm. as a strategy for some men, I guess. Um, so talk about then the difference between male and female aggression, violence, uh, homicide, and so on in primates and humans. There does seem to be a, a, certainly a difference. Pinker is fond of saying the number one predictor of, of violence is maleness, <laughs> uh, at mm -hmm. least physical violence. But, you know, as you point out, if, if you, it's not that women are, are just passive. They just have different ways of expressing their attempts at dominance or uh, aggressing against mm -hmm. uh, somebody that, that wrongs them. They just do it in a different way. Yeah, there's plenty of female competition in the primates. Plenty, plenty. Uh, uh, and so that idea that females are nice to each other and get along fine, and so th that's all <laughs> nonsense. F females can have high levels of solidarity, like the bonobo females, uh, and that's mostly directed against male aggression. Uh, so, so there's plenty of competition, but male aggression is something they all agree on, they want to stop, uh, and that's what they do. So, so but uh, female competition is very common, but it's less physical. That's the difference with the males. The males tend to physically uh, compete. And so male violence, if, if you want to mention one difference between the genders that is universal in the primates, male violence is higher than female violence in terms of physical, I mean physical violence. And uh, if you look at the, at the numbers for chimpanzees, for example, recently there was a study published on 152 cases of lethal aggression uh, in wild bonobos and chimpanzees. Of these 152 cases, only one concerned bonobos. And that was a suspected case, was not even observed. So bonobos are, are clearly more peaceful than chimpanzees, that's for sure. The second thing is that of, if you look at these 152 cases, it's mostly male to male, male against male. And this is true for human society too. Of course, we, we pay a lot of attention to men attacking women, uh, physical violence by men, but it is mostly, if you look at the murders in, in, in human societies, it's male to male. It's more common than male to female. So um, the, 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 the figures actually for chimpanzees and human society are very similar in many ways in terms of the violence and the bias, the gender bias is very similar too. So, so yes, that's, that seems to be um, a built-in difference between the, between the sexes that, that we find, at least in and, chimpanzees and why does and there need to be, what, from an evolutionary perspective, why does there need to be violence at all? Why do men need to aggress against other men? Well, men compete over resources, and, and the main resource is females. Other, other resources are sort of secondary, I think, but uh, they, copy, they, 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 they compete over matings. And um, the, there used to be the view, you know, uh, bef before we had DNA testing, we had the view that uh, alpha males do almost all the copulations. And so alpha males have almost all the children. That, that's how we looked at it. It's interesting. I, I lived through the time that DNA testing came up and we start, started to change the picture because we found uh, in, for example, rhesus monkey groups, that were studied at the time. If you watch the group, you see the alpha male copulate with all the females and you assume that he must be the father of all the children. But if you look at the DNA, you find that there's lots of younger males and less known males or lower ranking males who are fathers of children. And so what, what happens is that at night or behind the bushes uh, or behind the back of the alpha male, uh, the females arrange for copulations with uh, lower ranking males. So that's where female choice comes in. The, the females mm. have a big say about with whom they copulate. And uh, yes, the public copulations are with the alpha male, but there's other, all sorts of other stuff going on. So, so now we have a different view of that. But, but still, the, the highest ranking male has more offspring than lower ranking males. And that's, that's why we think the males compete so much, is that uh, males who have that competitive tendency, they will have more offspring, they will have more sons, and these sons inherit that same tendency. Mm. Right. Isn't that called the sneaky fucker strategy by the, by the lower-ranking males? 
Yeah, the, yeah that, that would be from the perspective of the males, you can call it sneaky, but uh, from the females also, there's a lot of uh, sneakiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too funny. Yeah, so, um, yeah. but much of it, uh, again, it involves not just survival. People misunderstand the goal of natural selection. It's not survival. It's it's getting your genes into the next generation, whatever that takes. So yeah, it's yeah. survival yeah, and yeah, reproduction, yeah. and not just reproduction, but but being around long enough to get your offspring into adulthood so that yeah. they can have children. So that gets us to the yeah, yeah, to the yeah. grandmother hypothesis you talk about, which we can also throw in the, you know, it, it, why did homosexuality evolve at all? That doesn't seem like a strategy natural selection would have, have developed, and yet, it, yet there it is. So there is something, there's a similar hypothesis to the grandmother hypothesis, right? That that uh, a homosexual sibling can act as a surrogate parent or a extended family member to support um, their their genetic uh, offspring through their sibling, something like that. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the question of how homosexuality evolved is driven by the idea that there is a clear dichotomy between homosexual and heterosexual which is not clear. Uh, I, I, Alfred Kinsey didn't think it was there, and I doubt it. Uh, uh, most recent analysis that I've seen, they say that most men are mostly heterosexual. What they mean is that homosexual tendencies are not completely disappeared from the heterosexual people. And so um, I, I don't think we should divide the world into homosexual and heterosexual, because then, yes, it becomes a puzzle. Because there are many homosexual uh, men, for example, who have children, so they have had sex with women and so on. And so um, I think it's the wrong question. As I think humans are pleasure seekers and, and sexual creatures. And sometimes this mixes with the um, intrasex bonding that we clearly have. Man bond with man, women bond with women. And if these two things get mixed, you get pleasure-seeking in other domains, like in male-male relationships or female-female relationships. So I think it was the wrong question, the, the question of how homosexuality evolved, because it assumes some sort of genetic divide between homo and heterosexual man, which, which no one has ever demonstrated. So I'm not sure it's the right question. Mm, interesting. And then the grandmother hypothesis. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that um, older females uh, help out with the offspring of their, um, their, grand ch their children, so, so their grandchildren, and um, mostly on the, on the maternal side. And uh, Kristen Hawkes has, of course, proposed that menopause uh, evolved for that reason. Menopause evolved in the human species so that women stopped reproducing, but they could still, they lived a long time after the, after the reproduction ends in order to, um, to help their uh, grandchildren. And we now know that in some orcas and, and other whales, this also happens, that, that they have a menopause too. So it's not unique to humans. But in, in the other primates, you know, uh, you may see a chimpanzee female like Flo, the famous female studied in Gombe by um, Jane Goodall, uh, these chimpanzee females, they keep going and going till they basically cannot carry the babies anymore. So they, they, they have a, a juvenile sitting on their back who is getting big and heavy, and they cannot really carry them anymore. So they, they, they would benefit, I think, from a menopause, but um, they, uh, they keep going till the very end. So, so I think um, humans are different in that we survive long after the end of reproduction. Mm. Yeah, for one of my books, I was researching why we die, and you know why why can't we just keep going and going and going and, and keep supporting our offspring and their offspring and their offspring? And the answer seems to be that grandparents serve a useful role, but great grandparents are, have largely fallen into disuse in terms of their great grandchildren's upbringing. There's enough family support that they're no longer needed and, and therefore you just need more room for and, and, and limited resources and so on, just not needed anymore. So natural selection sort of does the calculation that we need to keep the organism alive long enough for their offspring to become adults and then those offspring to become adults and then, then you're done. Yeah, yeah. 
But, but I also emphasize the caring tendencies of males. Uh, and, and this is important because in the present society, I don't know if you've noticed, people mock paternity leave. The conservatives, they, they think maternity leave makes sense, but paternity leave doesn't make sense because men don't need to take care of children. That's their view. Uh, and, and, and sometimes that is used as a biological argument, like men are not made to care for, for children and offspring. Uh, and for that reason, I find it important to point out that in the primates, in, in chimpanzees and bonobos, males have clearly a nurturing capacity. So even though normally they don't express it, normally uh, the females do almost everything with the carrying, feeding, protecting the offspring. Uh, if there is an orphan, that happens, that a mother loses her life and all of a sudden there's a, a juvenile uh, chimpanzee who needs care, uh, then all of a sudden, sometimes males adopt them. And so there, there, there are quite a few observations in the field of adult males, sometimes even alpha males, high-ranking males, who adopt an orphan. And not just for two days, they, they adopt them for five years sometimes. They carry them, they protect them, they help them eat, and so on. And so even these males who normally don't do much in this regard they have caring tendencies that come out at such a moment. I call it a potential. And the human, the human species is different because we evolved nuclear families and clearly the males are more involved in our species than uh, in chimps and bonobos. And, and one of the reasons we populate the earth with 8 billion people is because male involvement has allowed us to reduce the interbirth interval. From, from five to six years, what it is in, in chimps and bonobos, to three or four years, what it is in our species. And so that's why we are so successful, is because of the male involvement in families. Yeah. Yeah, my wife's from Germany, and they, you know, they have a pretty uh, advanced um, uh, program for maternity leave, but also paternal, paternity leave. I would take it. I work for a corporation. Uh, and, and not just because I want free time. It's like because I would care about my offspring. I have two. I have two children. I feel the same way that my wife does about our our son, for example. Uh, why would it be otherwise? You know, that's just such a weird attitude. Like, well, men don't need to spend as much time. Well, they don't feel the same. And, and I saw that with you know in, in the divorce courts where in the battle days, my parents were divorced in the late fifties. So my mom got primary custody, and I saw my dad every other weekend. And and you, you, I look back on that. This is absurd. My dad must have been heartbroken because mm -hmm. he feels the same way uh, yeah. as I feel, <laughs> and and men feel the same way as women feel about their offspring. That's just so barbaric. Yeah, in that regard, there's still quite a bit of discrimination. Yeah, based based on the assumptions, the, the assumptions that our biology dictates that. Women care for, for children and men don't. Uh, and, and I think with the younger generation, this is clearly changing. There mm -hmm. are clear changes underway. And, and I think if you look at the other primates, you can see that they have that same tendency. The males have a caring tendency and capacity. Another one of these hot-button political issues is the nuclear family, since you mentioned that. Conservatives say, well, that's natural. And, and, and the extremists on the other side say, no, no, it takes a village uh, you don't need a nuclear family. And so how do you think about that uh, in humans and other primates? I think in humans, uh, nuclear families evolved. They were not necessarily one male, one female children. Uh, it could have been a different arrangement. But male involvement in offspring care. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, humans are, as, as Sarah Hardy says, they're cooperative breeding in, in a way, is that many individuals are involved in the raising of offspring. So I think in that regard, uh, humans are a bit different from chimps and bonobos because in chimps and bonobos, the females do almost all of it. Uh, apart from protecting the young, which the males may do, uh, they don't do much with them, except uh, when there's an orphan, as I explained. So I think we have some unique tendencies that relate to the nuclear family. I, I, I don't think there's a, a clear description from biology that tells you what the nuclear family should look like I'm not mm -hmm. sure we can say that, you know. Right. But but there is a sense of pair bonding uh, in our species. Yeah, we, we have clearly, we fall in love, for example. 
Uh, there's all sorts of interesting oxytocin studies on that. Is that mm-hmm. oxytocin goes up, of course, when people fall in love. Uh, and 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 even though I see in the other primates that males have certain preferences for certain females and certain females for certain males, clearly you can see you can observe that. I, I've never noticed a process that I would call falling in love between them and uh, pairing off and isolating themselves and. Uh, I think that's a human thing. So, th- so that relates to our tendency for the nuclear family, I think. Yeah, I like Helen Fisher's books on this, uh, oxytocin and some of the other chemicals, dopamine, uh, that go way up when you're in love. And difference between being just sexually attractive is, is kind of a lust versus a, a longer term, deep, deep uh, affection for somebody, different, slightly different brain chemistry, but that it's super powerful. It's like an addiction. I mean, you get hit by it. She has these... You know, data sets of uh, of people that just once they attach to somebody, they just can't let go. And I mean, it's just an overwhelmingly powerful emotion. Yeah. Then you get the stalkers also, you know. <laughs> well, yes, so, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> that's, so there's that's, a negative side also, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. They can't let go. Right. Exactly. By the way, mm-hmm. Helen says that uh, the purpose of orgasm is 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 related to bonding. Like she even says, you know, a man that can give a woman an orgasm, she's going to stick around, right? She's she's going to be more attached to him or more deeply bonded to yeah. him. Yeah, I think I think orgasm makes perfect sense for for female female bonding, for male female bonding, uh, to make sex pleasurable for, for both sexes. That's basically what what happens. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and so, yeah, uh, th- there's a functional side to it, I'm sure. Is there anything to that uh, debate back in the 90s? I think it was the sperm wars debate where there was different kinds of sperm, the sperm that wants to get to the egg to fertilize it and the other little warrior sperms that fight off some other man's sperm that might be in there. And then they had all this stuff about like the shape of the penis, but the head is more of a plug to keep the sperm in there. And then the female vaginal contractions during orgasm are to kind of suck the sperm up into the uterus and stuff. But I haven't looked at any of that in a long time. I, some of that had a sense of just so storytelling, but I don't know if there anybody replicated any of those studies. Well, I don't hear much about it anymore. It was kam- kamikaze sperm, they called it. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> That's right. Kamikaze sperm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it sounded wonderful. It sounded like Star Wars, but then... Uh, at the at the sperm level, you know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. much about that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I haven't followed up on that either. But that, but that, you know, sense of again pair bonding is monogamy. So you hear these debates too overly simplified. Is monogamy the norm? Is polygamy the norm? If if it's not monogamy, I mean, if if monogamy is normal, how come there's been so many polygamous societies in human history and so forth? Yeah, I think mo- monogamy in human society. At present, it's more like an ideal. It's it's not necessarily the reality. Uh, and if you ask me, is the human a, a monogamous species? I, I think there's plenty of evidence that that we are more adventurous than that. You know. So so in in biology, we often distinguish genetic monogamy and social monogamy. Genetic is when all the offspring come from the from the same pair. Uh, social monogamy is most of the offspring comes from the same pair, <laughs> but not all of it. And and I think for many animals, it's more social, social than genetic. So yeah, that's um, I didn't get into that debate because I was looking more for the gender differences, and and in behavior and and development. And so so one of the things I wanted to look at, for example, is the um, the the games that young primates play. Or it's actually very striking how uh, young primates have similar interests in games as young humans, boys and girls. So, for example, um, the, the females are very interested in infants. And if you give them dolls, they're very interested in dolls and will take care of them. And in the wild, they collect wooden logs and rocks and hold them as, as dolls on them, on their body. Uh, so so fe- young females, long before they are mothers, they're very interested in infants and caring for them. And the young males have basically no interest in that. And, and the young males are very interested in roughhousing and, and mock fighting and running around and beating each other over the head in fun. 
Uh, that's what the young males do all the time. And if you look at human society, the studies on children, they, they document the same interest, that females are more interested in infants and infant care, and, and males are more interested in, uh, in rough and tumble play, it's called. So, so I think uh, that's the sort of differences that I, I wanted to explore uh, that seem to be universal in, in the primates and in humans. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I have a six-year-old son, so when I take him to Target to go to the toy section, he just blows past the girls' pink section with all the dolls and stuff, and sometimes I'll pick one up and go, is this the one you're looking for? And he looks at me like I've completely lost my mind. You know, he wants the trucks, the cars, the planes, and so on. But I have a daughter who <laughs> responded quite differently. So, and the fact that mm -hmm. it happens in primates means it can't just be a blue pink cultural thing of how I've raised my children or how people raise their children. No, so so I think the primates have this inherent interest. There is variability of course, just as in human children. You you will have occasionally a girl who wants a gun sure. and you will have a boy who wants a doll. I'm sure you're going to have that. But um you mentioned the colors, pink and blue. The colors are a cultural product it seems. So if you test very young children, like 18 months, I think it's 18 months, they tested children, and you show them uh, pictures and so on, the boys will look more at cars and trucks, and the girls will look more at dolls, but the color doesn't matter to them. Blue and pink doesn't matter. That comes in later, and, and that's why people think that is a cultural product. That's not something they are born with uh, as boys and girls. So when we dress our boys in blue and, and, and are very happy that we do that and feel very um, uh, confirming the culture and so on, uh, that's purely a cultural product, I think. The, the boys could also be dressed in pink and they would be perfectly happy, I think. <laughs> right. You see these pictures in the late 19th century or people like Teddy Roosevelt, you know, dressed in a little dress <laughs> when he was, a, you know, a, a young <laughs> child. <laughs> so yeah, nowadays, people... Nowadays, people might say that you are perverting him or you're, you're confusing yeah. him. Yeah. I don't think it was so confusing, these things, but uh, people make a big deal about it, yeah. How far are you willing to go with that in this terms of, like, boy, ma boys, males are interested in things and girls are more interested in people, and there, therefore later, decades later, when they choose careers and professions, women are more likely to go into people-oriented jobs and men are more interested in things oriented jobs again with lots of exceptions overlapping bell curves and so on yeah it's, it's possible I'm, I'm not an expert on children i don't know how strong these tendencies would be if you ask me as a primatologist i'm a bit skeptical because the studies of chimpanzee tool use for example indicate that females are slightly better than males at tool use and and one possibility is that they are better at tool use, of course, it's possible. Another possibility that is often mentioned is that males are too preoccupied with everything that happens around them, competition, sex, politics. They are very preoccupied with that, and so they, they, they don't concentrate enough on the task at hand of cracking nuts with stones or whatever they are doing. So that's a concentration problem. So then it's not a mental capacity problem, but a concentration problem. So, so um, but anyway, I, I don't see in the other primates evidence that males are more technological, so to speak, than females. Mm. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> so so that could be an artifact of could be an artifact of our culture, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even how it's studied. Again, back to this, you know, mm -hmm. primatologists and anthropologists were all mostly men until just the last few decades, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and to what extent are, are these natural primate uh, environments even available anymore, uh, given that, you know, they, they're shrinking in size? You know, if you yeah. study an animal in a zoo, that's just not the same, right? Or even like your primate center you have at Emory University, not quite the same as, you know, going out into the wild, right? So... How do you think yeah. about the sort yeah, of future but, but, of primatology? You know, as, far as, as far as mental capacities are concerned, I've worked all my life on animal intelligence. I, I know the literature inside out of animal intelligence, not just the primates. 
And there is very little on sex differences. If they were prominent, if there were prominent sex differences, I'm sure people would report them. Because that's an interesting detail to say the males are much better at this than the females or something like that. But you don't see these things. And I've never noticed. Uh, I, I've had, all, in all the intelligence testing that we did, for example, with computer touch screens and that kind of stuff, uh, we, we have brilliant individuals, but they, they are both sexes, basically. I, I, I don't think there's a system to it. And so I've never believed in um, mental capacity differences. There, there are a few related to, let's say, mental rotation, uh, you know, or in humans, early vocabulary. So, so there are a few of these cognitive differences that we notice. Um, but I think most of them have evaporated when the education for boys and girls became the same. And, and, you, and you, hear less and le you hear less and less about uh, that kind of different in capacity, you know. Uh, certainly for yeah. humans, but I would say yeah. also for the other primates. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, as far as I know, men and women don't differ at all on average IQ test scores. There seems to be a variation range, right, that the, the, the bell curve for men is slightly wider than the bell curve for women. So as they say, more geniuses, more dunces of men. Um, and and but I, I don't know if that's, that theory is going to hold. I, I I've heard what that's that called. argument. I, I, yeah, I've heard that argument, but th that the tales are different. But uh, I'm I'm not an expert on that, and I'm not sure how how sure we are yeah. on that. You know. Yeah, but but back to animal intelligence, it seems again, uh, they're not they're not us. They're you know they're millions of years different from us. Why would we think they could you know manipulate symbols on a computer screen and that indicates something that we need to know about their brains? They evolved in a different environment. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although some of these tests are interesting because, for example, the test with Ayumu, the chimpanzee, and the numbers has shown that if the numbers disappear within 200 milliseconds, he still remembers where they were. And so really? it, it is not so much the, it's not so much the number business that's interesting. It's the flash memory that he has mm. that seems mm. to be better than that of humans that is interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree that having them count things on a computer screen that doesn't relate really to anything that they do normally. Right. So, but what, right. what we do sometimes on, on the touch screens is we do face, face recognition, for example. Mm. So, so facial expressions or fa uh, faces. Uh, and I think that relates to natural behavior. So that's an important thing to test. Do primates uh, wear their emotions on their faces like humans? Yeah, and therefore that would be important. There's a lot of emotional expression. You know, people used to say that that humans had the most muscles in the face and because we need to express subtle emotions and more emotions than other species. Uh, but when five years ago uh, people analyzed post-mortem the face of a chimpanzee uh, and looked at all the muscles, they found exactly the same number uh, as in humans. As you would expect, chimpanzees are almost identical with us in, in, in physically. So, so it's, they have as many expressions of possibilities for expression as we do. And, and they have a lot of subtle expressions. They have very flamboyant expressions like we also do when we cry or laugh and things like that. Uh, but they also have a lot of subtle expressions. Mm -hmm. What about language in primates? You think about to what extent they can communicate anything remotely like we can. It does seem to be a thing special to humans, although I know there's, you know, like Coco the Gorilla. And I think it was one of the TED Talks that I think it was Sue Savage Rumbaugh had. I think it was her. And she had the, the video of the chimp signing. And again, it was like this. You can clearly see the chimp is signing this and everybody's looking at like, are you sure that's... Mm -hmm. Is that really what I'm looking at? Or are you priming me, telling me this is what I'm supposed to be seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the I wrote this book, uh, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are?, in which I go over all the cognitive studies in, in primates and, and humans and, and so on. And the only difference in that book that I recognize between humans and other species, because I think cognitively we are very similar to many other species, is language. I, I think language is really special. It's, it's a learned symbolic communication. So it's not even 
You're not even born with it. You have to learn uh, the words of your language. And, and it's symbolic. And I don't see that in other species. And so, for example, a chimpanzee who has been in a fight with somebody, and uh, the next day he, he meets his friends, he cannot explain what happened, and he cannot explain who did it, and what the sur- he cannot explain anything about it. Well, that's a huge difference with our species. We can talk about things that are not in view, that, that are not here and, and not at the same time. And, and so that gives us possibilities for communication that are just incredible. I'm not even talking about poetry or libraries. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the very basic fact that I can explain something to you that happened elsewhere, you know? So I, I think uh, language is a big deal. Uh, and of course, it permeates everything we do. Uh, uh, also, our thinking. Our thinking is, is shaped to some degree by language. So that's a big difference. Uh, all the other differences I consider minor or shades of gray, basically. Hmm. Do you have a, th- a story or a theory about why or how language evolved? Is it a single genetic mutation? Is there a combination of things? It cannot be just one mutation that, that does that. <laughs> no, it's too big for that. So um, I don't know how it evolved. Um, and I don't, we don't even know when it evolved. Because, of course, we, we may look at, at written language, but that's clearly a, a, a later development, written language. And so uh, I don't know when we started to speak, for example. And some people have, have speculated that it started with gestures. It didn't even start with the voice. That is the gestural language hypothesis. Uh, and in that regard, it's interesting that uh, chimps and bonobos have many similar gestures to us. So, they, for example, they can beg for food like this. They hold up their hand and they beg for food like we, we do when we're hungry. We, we hold up the hand. So, so, so they have many gestures in common with us. And so maybe it started with gestural language uh, and, and, and the speech came only much later. Yes, and written even later still. I mean, Neanderthals may have had language, right? So that's half a million to a million years ago. But writing is only, what, 3,300 BC, so about 5,000 years old. You know, I'm just going through this with my son. You mm-hmm. know, I, I didn't teach him to speak. I didn't do anything. He just learned it, <laughs> just, just listening to people. But now he's learning to write and read. And, it, oh, man, this is, you know, a massive effort every day for hours and this is going to take years like that is not natural yeah yeah so neanderthals i'm sure they spoke so neanderthals always get a bad rap Uh, you know uh, the neanderthals were always stupid we were so smart and they were stupid and uh, the more we learn about them they're almost identical to us and they probably inter well they interbred with us we know that now we have we have neanderthal dna in us so uh, for me, that's uh, inconceivable that they would not have language. They had art also. They had probably music. And so, yeah, they were like humans, very close to us. Yeah. yeah. Well, Franz, we've been going almost an hour and a half here. I want to give you a chance to kind of give us the big overview. I love the book. It's a perfect timing because, you know, our latest issue of Skeptic is on trans matters. This is huge. Transgender, oh. sex, all this stuff. Okay. It's in the daily... Daily news uh-huh. and and uh, so so give give us kind of the take home message. What is it we 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 are going to learn from your book and in terms of how to think about these things? Well, I think what you learn is that um, you cannot remove biology from the gender question. It, it is not a purely cultural question. It has a biological component that relates to our primate background. Uh, I can unfortunately not simplify things. So the primate background, if you look at chimpanzees and bonobos, is complex because in the primates we see different behavior. We see female leadership, male leadership, uh, and and gender is also applicable to them. They have cultural influences too, like we do. And so I, I cannot provide a simple answer to the gender question based on what the primates show us, even though there are some core differences that I think we see in all the primates, in, in us and in them, such as female interest in infants or male interest in combat, you know, 
those are sort of general differences. Um, but I, but I, uh, my main point is to emphasize that the gender debate needs to include biology. And uh, that when we talk about gender diversity, like homosexual orientation or um, transgender people, uh, we are not talking about a, a uniquely human phenomenon. I think that same variability can be found elsewhere. And, and so uh, there's no simple answer, but clearly biology needs to be put into the debate. Well, thank you for doing that. We definitely need that. <laughs> Just to kind of wrap it up and say thank you uh, for all your, your work. What is the future of primatology? How's the funding for it? What's the status of the species, you know, bonobos, chimps, and orangs in the wild and gorillas? Um, you know, are you hopeful for, for that? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of enthusiasm by young scientists. So we have a lot of good young scientists who want to be involved with the primates. Uh, there is funding, but it's it's not massive. It's, I think funding has been better for that field than it, than it is now. Um, there is, of course, the worry that many primates will disappear from the wild. Uh, they are under threat. And, and that's why many of the field worker primatologists, they need to work on the conservation at the same time. They cannot just do their behavioral science. They, they get involved in conservation also. So... Um, the future is there, and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of the young, younger generation is clearly there. And I think there's a lot to do still. So uh, I hope it continues. And, and, and then in, with the cognitive studies, I think many of them need to include a little bit of neuroscience. So we need to develop um, non-invasive neuroscience. I hope, I hope we're not going to do the things that we did in the past of cutting out parts of the brain and things like that. We need to have a non-invasive neuroscience the way we have that for humans too. We can put mm. humans in a scanner and, and look at their mental processes that way. And I think we need to develop something like that for the primates as well. Oh, right. Who's your colleague at Emory that, uh, that does brain scans on dogs? Gregory. Yeah, um, there's Greg Burns. Greg, Greg Burns. Burns. Yes, Greg Burns. Yeah, yes. he, he, trains that... dogs to, he trains dogs to be in the scanner. And actually, there are some... Some primate institutes, like in France, I know one mm. where they are training monkeys to be in the scanner. So then you get mm. non-invasive neuroscience going. Yeah, Interesting. That would be fascinating. Mm. Yeah, it would be fascinating to see chimps or bonobos doing those same kind of tasks where they're pressing keys on a little keyboard and they have a, you know, a little TV monitor mm -hmm. that they can see choices to see if other brains compare to ours. I would think that would be difficult mm -hmm. to train them. But if you can train a dog, you can certainly train a bonobo or a chimp to do it. Yeah, there's, there, there's all sorts of innovations now going on in, in that field. For example, eye tracking is, is a very important area mm. now uh, b because you know exactly on the screen where uh, the chimp or the bonobo is looking. So, so all of mm. that is being developed at the moment. So, mm. so the technology right. is catching up with that field, yeah. Right. Good. All right. That's a good place to end it, Franz. Thanks so much for your book. Thanks for your work. Thanks for coming on the show to talk. Thank you. Thanks.